The following program is brought to you by Podcast One Sportsnet. This episode of the Steve Austin Show is sponsored in part by DDP Yoga. Hey man, working hundreds of matches over the years, ain't no surprise that my body is taking its share of bumps and bruises. And my buddy Diamond Dallas Page knows all about the wear and tear the ring takes on your body, and his DDP Yoga Fitness System was specifically designed to burn fat reduce pain, and heal from injuries. Dallas is so positive that you'll absolutely love the DDPY program and using the DDPY app that he's doing something he ain't never done before. He's going to give you seven days free to try it out. That's a week to try the program, explore the app, and own your life, and it's completely free. DDP Yoga can work for all ages, weights, and fitness levels. It's a kick-ass cardio workout that will dramatically increase your flexibility and strengthen your core like never before, all with minimal joint impact. Just for listeners of the Steve Austin Show, you can save 20% off an annual membership for the DDP Yoga Now app off any DVD pack. Just go to ddpyoga.com forward slash Austin to get started and check us out. DDP is headed back to the UK and is putting on another DDPY Inspiration Meets Perspiration Workshop for one night only, Thursday, April 19th at Frome Sport and Fitness in Somerset, England. Come on over to this incredible three-hour workshop where you'll get to meet DDP, get a kick-ass workout, and hear DDP's secrets to staying motivated. Get your workshop tickets at ddpyogaworkshops.com. Can't make the workshop? Don't worry. You can still catch DDP in person at the Wales Comic Con April 21st and April 22nd. Details and tickets are at walescomiccon.com. The following program is a Podcast One.com production. From Hollywood, California, by way of the Broken Skull Ranch, this is the Steve Austin Show. Give me a hell yeah. Hell yeah. Now, here's Steve Austin. All right, everybody, welcome to the Steve Austin Show. I am coming to you from the mean streets of Los Angeles, California today. I'm sitting here at 317 Gimmick Street. Holy smokes. Ever since morning, it's been raining cats and dogs over here. Now, right where I'm at in Marina Del Rey, things are going to be fine. But out there in the outlying areas, right outside of Los Angeles, man, there's going to be a lot of mudslides because of all the fires burning the vegetation. Some of these areas are going to get four to five inches of rain. And, man, they've already started evacuating some of the neighborhoods. There's going to be mudslides. A lot of people are going to lose their houses. I wish everybody the best in this. Hopefully everybody comes out good, but I don't think that's going to happen. When it rains out here in California, doesn't happen very often, but when it does, because of all the vicious cycles of the fires and the rains and just, hey, can't no vegetation ever really grow. So the dirt can't stay nowhere. On these inclines, when it starts raining, it turns into mudslides. So we got a full-blown cluster muck going over here. It don't matter if you're on the West Coast, East Coast, down there in the coastal regions in the South. Uh, everybody's going to get some. Hell, the East Coast, hell, they're getting a bunch of snowstorms and stuff still. So it has been a crazy winter, and the craziness continues out here in the main streets of Los Angeles. I wish everybody out here that are in harm's way the best and hang in there. Anyway, moving on down, man, I tell you what, I just had a real good time talking to Edge and Christian on their podcast. I don't know, the podcast that reeks of awesomeness. And I was on the phone with Edge Christian and the one and only Brett the Hitman Hart. And those guys wanted to have us both on and kind of break down the historic match we had at WrestleMania 13 way back in the day in Chicago at the Rosemount Horizon, one of my favorite matches of my career. And so they kind of picked our brains, and we kind of shot the breeze, talked about the different elements of the match. I thought it was going to be a recipe for disaster, you know, trying to make a submission match, which you put Stone Cold in because I had a very limited offense and no real submission moves in my arsenal. So I thought it was going to be a cluster muck. Turned out to be an instant classic that would stand the test of time and an iconic image at the end of the match with me bleeding like a stuck pig in that sharpshooter applied by Brett the Hitman Hart, and what was to become a double turn. Brett would go from baby to heel. I would go from heel to baby as the work and the storylines progressed. Nonetheless, man, I had a good time talking to those guys. It was good to hear Brett's voice, hear his thoughts on the match, uh, his takeaways, and some of the things that uh, happened in the match. One thing in particular that I forgot and a couple of tidbits of information that I've never told anybody about that match. So look for that match. Uh, if you look up Edge and Christian on social media, you can find out when that podcast is going to drop. 
I guess we shot the breeze for damn near about an hour and a half. Had a good time going down memory lane, and uh, it's nice to hear Bret Hart's voice. So check that out. Uh, I was real happy with the interview, talking about that match, because it meant so much for my career. And Bret the Hitman Hart, as an opponent inside the squared circle uh, against Stone Cold Steve Austin, was a huge part of me reaching the success that I reached. But anyway, uh, check that out on their podcast today. Man, I'm sitting here shooting the breeze with Ted Fowler 361 down there in Rockport, Texas. I uh, gave him a call the other day and said, hey, man, you got anything to talk about? He goes, damn right. So we hooked it up, came over here, shot the breeze and had a conversation. We got disconnected for some technology problems, and then we got hooked back up. Uh, Sean over at Podcast One is going to take care of that little error with me. Uh, always seems to be a technological issue with this show. But nonetheless, it was good to hear from Ted Fowler. Hear what he's doing down there in uh, Rockport, Texas. Staying busy, working seven days a week, trying to put that city back together. And then coming up on next Tuesday's show, uh, I got a direct message from James Ellsworth, former WWE superstar. He got his notice a while back and has gone on to work some independent shots. And I was always real enamored with the James Ellsworth character on WWE Watching, uh, you know, him cut his promos, doing all the things, the shenanigans he did, uh, the match with Braun Strowman, the match with AJ Styles, and watching that kid get over. Guy's been around since, well, he got into business 2002, and then he finally got that call up to uh, WWE, and you'll hear him tell a story about how that match with uh, Braun Strowman was born, and Arn Anderson comments and stuff like that, but it was good, really good talking to James and connecting with him. Uh, he's a guy that I never got a chance to spend a whole lot of time with or talk about, but I remember watching him uh, on the WWE product on television saying, hey man, this guy is really getting over. And, you know, as James will be the first to tell you, he's not the biggest guy in the world. And so he had a lot of things going against him, but it was that character. It was the delivery of the lines, and he'll get into that. And damn, if the kid and the stories didn't get himself over, and all of a sudden, he gets a phone call, and... WWE career comes to an end. Maybe it will begin somewhere again down the road. But nonetheless, he is my guest coming up on the Tuesday podcast of the Steve Austin Show. And uh, I had a good time talking with that guy, so I hope you guys will check it out. Man, I'm fixing to bust into my gym and get my workout on after I finish this open and get my clothes done. I'm training like a madman. Got a couple of things coming up. I'm looking forward to going down there to WrestleCon on April 7th and 8th, and that'll be a Saturday and a Sunday, the day before and the day of WrestleMania, and signing autographs, taking pictures, and meeting everybody. There's going to be people coming in from all over the world. I don't know how many countries they're coming from, but uh, it's going to be cool down there. I'm looking forward to the atmosphere and the energy that WrestleMania always brings to uh, a city where they're having that major event in and how many millions and millions of dollars that that product, that company brings in to the region that they go to. So it could be pretty spectacular at that WrestleCon event. I mean, everybody that's not in WWE, I mean, you know, a lot of former WWE superstars are going to be there, but pretty much anybody and everybody is going to be there. So it's going to be a good time, and I'm looking forward to it. Training, uh, just getting in shape to make a good appearance, sign autographs, and do all that BS. So I'm looking forward to seeing everybody if you come on down there. But anyway, uh, with no further ado, without me sitting here flapping my gums, I'm going to get here and uh, get Ted Fowler 361 on the phone and shoot the breeze and talk about the good old days. But before we get to Ted Fowler, here's some words from our sponsor. Backbreaker. Deathlock. Brain Buster, Exploder, Goozle, Tombstone, Skull Cracker, Vertebraker, Spear, Gore, Stunner. Whether you're a construction worker, warehouse worker, or even a pro wrestler, if you hear certain words on a job site, it can make work painful and uncomfortable, usually for your opponent. So at least get work gear that's comfortable. Timberland Pro work shirts, pants, and boots. Head to toe, Timberland Pro, not uncomfortable. True crime fans rejoice. Small Town Murder is now on Podcast One. Crime and Sports' James Petragallo and Jimmy Wisman look at small towns, what makes them tick, and the murders that took place there. In-depth research, horrible tragedy, and the host's comedic spin on the whole thing. What can go wrong? 
Nation. Subscribe to hear new episodes every Thursday on PodcastOne.com, the Podcast One app, and Apple Podcasts. This is the Steve Austin Show. All right, I just hit the record button. Me and Ted Fowler, 361, are going to try to slug through a podcast without dropping an F-bomb. I don't know if it's humanly possible, but if anybody's going to give it the damnedest try, it's going to be me and Ted Fowler, 361. Hello, Teddy. How are you today? Hey, man, I'm doing good. Doing good. How about yourself? Well, other than the fact that you and me have been cluster effing around for the last five minutes, you tried, you can't hear me, and then I'm trying to hear the damn, uh, to check the levels on this thing, and I got it minimized, so every time I pushed it, it was down there in the right-hand corner, I didn't know what the hell I was doing, so after I figured out what, what I'm, anyway, it's a cluster, Ted. I'm opening up a Diet Red Bull right now, the old uh, 8.4 fluid ounces. I need about 16. I'd rather be drinking Jack. It's too early to drink Jack. I haven't worked out yet, so I'm going to drink a Red Bull while I have a conversation with you. How you doing down in Rockport? It's been a while since we talked. Uh, yes, sir, it has been. Uh, it is 8 o'clock here. That means it's happy hour. So I have a Jack and Coke in front of me. Trying to relax after another day down here in the grind. God dang it, man. I went to the uh, little grocery store I shop at. and trying to get tuned up, making an appearance down there at WrestleMania uh, in New Orleans. I'm not being a part of WrestleMania. I'm going down to do WrestleCon for the 7th and the 8th. So I figured, hey, man, I got in pretty good shape on that keto diet. And then, of course, as uh, all things happen, you know, hell, I got back on the ski. So now I'm back on Skid Row. I stopped at the uh, little Jack Daniels uh, station there at the liquor store there in the grocery store. And I had a choice, Teddy. I had three options. A was a half gallon. B was a liter. C was a fifth. Can you guess which one I got? A. Now, normally, Teddy, you would be right. I would have got a half gallon. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but seeing this, I got to get fit. I went with the C option and just got the fifth. You know, the, the thing that's easier to tell about the fifth is because it's a smaller bottle, you can see the volume, you know, go down pretty easy. So you can really get a hold of how much you're actually drinking. With that damn half gallon, it's all out the damn window. You don't know it until the next morning when you open up the freezer and the bottle's half gone and you're like... <laughs> Oh, Colorado. It's no wonder my head hurts. Well, that's yeah. Yeah, exactly. Everything adds up. That's why I got such a damn headache. God <laughs> dang. Uh, you know, we still got this uh, this this uh, podcast going here. We're not saying any F-bombs, but pretty much about everything else will fly as right. long as organic to the conversation. And I hate to hear people say organic. I hate people say surreal. What else do I hate people say? All kinds of stupid shit, nonetheless. Dude, how's work down there? What are you up to? You know what? I just finished a piling repair job in Key Allegro. Um, tomorrow morning, we're changing out about half a dozen windows for some people in the morning. And then in the afternoon, uh, people had their, rip, rip, or their roof ripped off, put a new roof on for them. And now I'm putting tongue and groove naughty pine up on the ceiling of their bedroom. You know, just rebuilding stuff. Hey, man, how's the roofing stuff going? Have you, have you caught on to it? You got it all figured out now? You know what I do? I mean, once, once I mean, I'm no expert in it. And I couldn't, you know, couldn't do one start to finish, but I am picking up on it. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's like anything else. Not terribly difficult, but there are, you know, it is a process and you have to follow, you know, the, the right procedures to keep it leak free. And, you know, touch wood, man, we've, we haven't had any leaks yet. Well, I got a question for you because you you just brought up the word windows, and I'm over here in this little last studio place I got right here beside 316 Gimmick Street. The house was built, I think, in about 1953. It's a small house, about 1,100 square feet, and man, these windows, Teddy, they got to be original windows. They ain't worth a damn. The heat doesn't stay in the house, and the coldness doesn't stay in the house. Ain't got no AC. But my biggest problem is not the heat or the cold, Teddy. I got a 15-pound ball of fur next door that barks nonstop 24-7. When that son bitch hears me walk on the gravel to come over here, he starts yapping at the top of his lungs. Now, I'm not going to do anything to the dog. I, I, I would think that the people that own the dog would have enough sense, common sense. Hell, they got off work. They're there right now, and the son bitch is barking his full head off. It's bothering me over here. It, it's got to be tearing them to shreds over there. So my question, Teddy, to go back to the windows is, 
dude, what do I got to do? Get some soundproof hurricane windows? What do I need to do to just block that GD dog out of my god dang podcast studio? Man, hurricane windows would help with the sound deadening because obviously they're, you know, thicker. What kind of projects you got going on there, Teddy? Because I got some projects I'm going to drop on you. Um, you you want to share one of yours or you want me to go share one of mine with you? Sure. Okay. So anyway, you got the studio next door, right? And that's where I'm yep. sitting at right now. Callie's laying right beside me, man. She's a year and one month old. Man, that dog is crazier than a shithouse rat. She's going to be a good dog, but she is a handful. So anyway, I was over at podcast and Kristen come over. And she sees this black cat in the front yard over here. And you know how Kristen is. She's a dog lover. We ain't really cat people, but since she sees the cat, she figures ain't nobody feeding the cat. So for the past couple months, every time I come over here to shut this place up, I put out a can of cat food and some dry food to go for the damn cat. Now we got a water dish for the little bastard. (laughs) So it's got a collar on it, but the collar's just ringing ass tight. You can tell that's some bitch, you know, if we're, what we're trying to do now, Teddy, is we're trying to trap the cat with like a have a heart trap or something like that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we want to catch him, cut the collar off so the son bitch can breathe, take him down to the vet, get him some shots because he looked like he got a little mange or something going on. Right. So, you know, I'm in here. In the mean streets of Los Angeles, California, I'm not out there like Mitch, my brother-in-law, trapping a mountain lion. I ain't trying to trap a tiger. Hell, I ain't trying to trap a bobcat. I'm trying to trap a damn house cat. That's the kind of exciting shit I do in Los Angeles. And and to make it sound just a little bit tougher, this ain't no house cat. This is an alley cat. (laughs) He's a black cat, so if you're superstitious, couldn't bring me bad luck. So I don't care what I got to do, Teddy. I'm going to put a little have a heart trap out there, trap that little bastard, take his ass. I'm going to cut the collar off of him. He's got a tag on it. And so, of course, Kristen does all the damn protocol steps that you would do when you find an animal such as this. She puts an ad in a local neighborhood gimmick paper, the watch sheet or whatever you call it. Everybody finds out what's going on in the neighborhood, who's getting broken into, who ain't, all that kind of stuff. So, of course, she puts in, hey, found a black cat, put a picture of it. How many responses do you think she got, Teddy? None. Not one single person claimed responsibility for this damn cat. It's got a tag on it. Don't know if the person kicked the bucket. What's up? I just know that I'm feeding the son bitch every single night, trying to get the collar off of it. And that's one of the most exciting things in my life right now is trying to trap a damn alley cat so I can get us some medical assistance. I'll tell you what, it could be a heck of a lot more exciting if you do, in fact, trap that alley cat and try to take it out of that trap. Because I bet that that thing's going to come out Dude, with, guns, with guns blazing. Dude, yeah. I already thought about that because I know that cat's got his claws. And I ain't stupid. I ain't going to get no welding. I ain't even going to mess with the son bitch. <laughs> Teddy, this cat probably weighs about, I don't know what a cat weighs, but he's on the small side, eight or ten pounds. But he's got claws, and that son bitch would tear me to shreds. And that'd be another thing. I'd be walking around the mean streets of Los Angeles with a patch on my right eye. What happened, Stone Cold? <laughs> and a little cat I was trying to tra- trap and scratch my eye out. Yo, oh, a Winky the cat got the best of me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that that may be that may be an endeavor you don't want to partake in trying to catch that cat. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm all about helping animals, but uh, ah, you know, people with their cats, they're different, man. You know, they're they're outdoor cats, and you know, people don't look at them the same. Not not everybody. That's kind of a generalization, but a lot of people. It's it's, it's an animal. Let it go out there and hope for the best. You know, unlike dog owners who, for the most part, keep their animals locked up. Yeah, you know, which you know. which brings which brings me to a funny story. What happened? <laughs> oh, Saturday night, man. I don't know what happened, but uh, when I went to the liquor store, you know, the Lord hates a quitter, so I picked up two half gallons. <laughs> you know, <laughs> who said the Lord didn't like a quitter? <laughs> <laughs> I, I read that somewhere. You know? so I'm, I'm sitting here at the house and I start drinking old Jack and Coke, and about three a.m. I mean, obviously, I'm in bed. About 3 a.m., I wake up, and I have Thunderdome going on in my bedroom because, you know, now I got four dogs. So I'm I'm looking around going, it's 3 a.m. This is not acceptable. I walk outside. I turn the light on, open the door, let everybody go outside to go to the bathroom, thinking they'll come back in and lay down, and, you know, we can catch a few more Zs. That is not the case. They come inside, and they are worse after going to the bathroom. So I'm I'm still about half in the bag. I go out and I open up the laundry room door, which is basically the entry to the kennel, 
get all four dogs up in there, close the door, stagger back into the house, plop down on the bed and go to sleep. Well, right about first light, my neighbor goes for his daily walk and I hear a very deep bark coming from my front yard. And I go, you know what? That sounds amazingly like Cassie and she's not supposed to be in the front yard. I walk over to the blind, open it up. Sure enough, I'm looking at Cassie. She's out of the kennel. I'm like, oh God. I go to the back of the house, out the door. Those guys were playing grab ass and they knocked open the gate to the kennel. I usually put a little carabiner clip on the latch. I failed to do so. Now I'm looking at three dogs. My white pointer is gone. So I drive around for about an hour and a half looking for this dog. She's got a microchip. She's got collar on and she's the only one with a rabies tag on because I don't like to hear those rabies tag, you know, rattle. I get back to the house and I said, well, I've done all I can. Hopefully somebody calls. I walk outside to start a load of laundry. Who do you think is standing outside of the kennel? Omira. I, she, she was running around in the brush somewhere and she's like, hey, dude, I'm ready for breakfast now that I've had, you know, my, my, you know, but yeah, I don't know where she went. I don't have the slightest idea. But when I walked out there, she's standing there on the steps going, you know, hey, I'm ready to be let back in. Dude, I know about your three German short hair pointers, but how did you pick up the fourth dog? I saw it on Instagram. Oh, that brindle boxer. Yeah, I mean, dude, I went and did a job for some people on the very road that I live on and They've got a couple of acres. This Brendel Boxer's running around. She's a sweetheart of a dog. Just star for affection, spade female. Uh, she's She'll be two years old in April. You know, and I've got my guys working. I'm over on the other side of the house playing with a dog. You know, I'm just, I'm just having a great time. You know, you guys keep working. I'm going to go, you know, play with the dog. Well, when the job got done, I went inside to give those people a bill. And they were like, hey, we want to talk to you about some more work. And I said, cool. I said, maybe we could work out a trade agreement on that dog. And they were like, oh, that's that's a friend of ours and blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, if you ever need a pet sitter, I'm right down the road, you know, just yep. kind of tongue in cheek and, you know, down the road you go. Well, the girl works at the Speedy Stop here, the, the convenience store. I stopped in there one day for breakfast taco and she says, hey, were you serious about taking that boxer? And she's like, my house got destroyed in the storm. I'm living in an apartment. I've got to keep her crated up all day. You know, it's not fair to the dog. And I said, hey, why don't you let me keep her for, you know, a month or so until you get in a better, better spot? And she's like, no, you know what? I just soon give her away and, you know, kind of out of sight, out of mind. So I said, well, four can't be much more work than three. So I went ahead and got her over here to the house. How did the boxer fit in with the German short hairs? You ought to see it. I mean, you, you know, you know how my short hairs are anyway. I mean, they are, you know, they're, they're hell on wheels. This poor boxer tries to keep up with them, but you know, she's a little timid, you know, and rightly so you yeah. saw you know, how maniacal my, my pointers are, but she'll give chase as best she can. And her and Mira just growl and flop around and just, you know, play like a couple of kids. It is so much fun to watch them, you know, until they get into the house and then they start tearing shit up in the house. You know, but yeah, no, and she fit, you know, she has fit right in with the pack, sleeps on the bed with everybody, jumps up on the couch, oh, curls up. Yeah, that's that's why I got a California king bed, <laughs> you know, so I can accommodate, you know, me and four dogs. Well, how is the boxer as a breed? I mean, because I know your other three dogs, well, I know the two hunt and the other one's probably going to get spun up here pretty quick. But how how is the boxer just as a breed to hang out with? Because I, I don't really know how, too, too much about the boxers. And, Dude, she's, she's goofy and playful and uh, not aggressive. You know, like I said, a little bit timid. Um, and she's real small. She only weighs about 30 pounds and she's almost two years old. Um, yeah. You know, but I mean, just a, a, a beautiful, well, I mean, you know the drill. I mean, yeah. she was pretty, yeah. pretty skinny, uh, trying to fatten her up, you know. <laughs> you know, but I mean, just obedient, you know, the sit, the stay, um She's learning how to walk on the leash, you know, but I mean, I, as a kid, I wanted a boxer. I just thought they looked cool, but I never got one. And I always went bird dogs, you know, and I did, you know, I'm a, I'm a big baby about animals anyway, you know, or especially dogs, you know, so I couldn't, you know, 
I, I just, you know, gravitated to her that first first time, you know, so may as well may as well take her. What the hell? But that begs to ask a question, Teddy, with three dogs, and now you bring in the fourth boxer into the fold, everybody's sleeping in bed with you. That used to be known as the boom boom room from podcasts back in the day. <laughs> What's up with that? <laughs> Dude, every once in a while, I bring one in from out of town, uh, you know, so so the dogs and I kind of have an agreement, you know, I mean, I keep feeding them a good quality food, you know, two two square meals a day, uh, you know, turn the air conditioning on for them out there in the, in the you know, dog house when it's hot. They allow me my conjugal visits from time to time. <laughs> yeah, you know, because everybody's like, oh, your dogs are so cute. It's like, really? Yeah, hold on to your skirt, sugar. I'm going to let him in. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's take a quick pause for the calls and give big ups to True Car. Now, if you're looking to buy a car, you're probably familiar with terms like MSRP. You might even know what it stands for. But what does it actually mean? The same goes for invoice, list price, dealer price. It's enough to confuse anybody. All you're really looking for is a price that actually means something. Introducing True Price from True Car. Now you can know exactly what you'll pay for the car you want, including fees and accessories before you even get to the dealership. True Car dealers will show you the true price on cars like the one you want, all from the comfort of home. And how do you know if your true price is a great price? Because True Car shows you and other people paid for the same car you want. And your certified dealers know this, so they set their true price competitively so they can win your business. So when you're ready to buy a new or used car, visit True Car to enjoy a more confident car buying experience. Some features not available in all states. You're also going to need car insurance for that new vehicle. Go to GEICO.com and in 15 minutes you can be saving 15% or more on car insurance. That's right. Save hundreds of dollars on car insurance at GEICO.com. Extra money in your pocket? It may just be the most rewarding thing you do today. Hello, guys. It's MMA fighter Chael Sonnen. Check out my podcast, You're Welcome, with Chael Sonnen every Wednesday and Friday right here at Podcast One. We cover the latest in mixed martial arts and everything else going on in the world of sport. Listen free to You're Welcome with Chael Sonnen, exclusively available on Apple Podcast at podcastone.com and on the Podcast One app. If you love the show, share it with a friend and leave us a rating and review. This is the Steve Austin Show. God dang, Teddy, uh, we uh, brought Neil, my nephew, and Brandy and Emma down to uh, L.A. and we drove up to Nevada to the place. And uh, then we flew Neil into Reno. We picked his ass up. And we were over there hanging out, having a good time. And you know, Neil golfs for the Edna, well, Ganada High School golf team. And yeah. he's pretty damn good. So, man, there's all kinds of golf courses over in the area that I was at. But, of course, we was trying to sightsee and keep everybody happy, so we never got a chance to go golfing. So we end up back in Los Angeles. We'll get rejected this one place. They're doing repairs on the course. Of all times, when my nephew's down, they're doing repairs on the course. So we find a place not too far from my house, and we go out to the driving range. And you got a game of golf, Teddy. How long have you been playing golf? Man, probably about... 15 years. Are you working this year? years? Dude, I'm, I'm mid 80s. You know, oh, shoot the pretty good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. well, you got to remember, dude, I also got a tee box here at the house and a couple of holes. So, I mean, That's I got, right. you know, yeah. It was like a time I asked you if you want to play darts at the ranch. <laughs> Or I asked you if you did play. So, hey, you know, I play a little bit. And, of course, then you continued to, to thump me. And I don't even think I won one goddamn game. That was bullshit. <laughs> it's it like getting a hustle in a pool hall. So, anyway, that, that, that only up my alcohol intake. Can't stand losing. So, anyway, we go to this driving range. And, man, shit, Teddy, I ain't picked up a club in, I don't know, 10 years. And before, right. before that, it was 10 more years. And in my entire life, I've probably golfed. I don't know, four games, maybe five. And as far as like going to the driving range and just hitting balls, I might have hit, I don't know, 10 or 20 buckets in my entire life. So we go out there and Neil's pretty damn good. Dude's got a good, smooth, easy swing, just just cranks on it. Doesn't even look like he's hitting it hard. He's just knocking the dog shit that ball and it's flying straight. You'd, you'd really enjoy it uh, because you know a little bit more about the game than I do. So, yeah. dude, I go over there. My right arm doesn't straighten out. It's like, it's like handing a, uh, a golf club to a T-Rex and say, here, man, drive this thing. <laughs> <laughs> 
I did the little arbitrary stretches, twist from side to side, made sure my right. hamstrings were loosened up. You know, I went through the warm ups. <laughs> Dude, the first two I hit, I sent in the orbit. I think they're still rotating around the Earth's atmosphere. <laughs> Dude, I got a hold of a two of two of them, and then when Neil came back, I think it went to take a leak or something. And from that point on, dude, I got lucky twice is what I'm saying. From that point on, just the ugliness of my form reared its head. I mean, I Kristen and me went today, and uh, I was hitting them pretty good last night because I'm hooked on it now, and all I have is right. a driver. I went down to the uh, sporting goods store, and uh, man, they had one of those video screens that you hit into. And uh-huh, uh-huh. It tells you all the miles per hour, this, that, whatever. And I went through a couple of clubs and ended up with this damn club that I got. And so I was hitting them better with my new club. But anyway, dude, I, I'm out there with Neil, and he took a video of me that I didn't know he was taking of me. And I only take about a three-quarter swing. I know this now because I watched the video, and mm-hmm. then I don't follow through at the end. So I'm starting off with a three-quarter swing. I don't follow through. And the, the rest of the swing between, the, you know, the back swing and the follow-through looks like shit as well. <laughs> dude, I'm hitting them straight. I'm hitting them pretty far. but And I'm thinking, dude, I'm, I'm watching, you know, like what's a guy's name? Bubba Watson. I'm watching right. Tiger Woods. I'm watching Jordan Spieth. All the guys that are like the, the, the hot-ass golfers right now. I mean, I'm watching these guys. Dude, when they hit those balls, they just just like they're shot out of a, a cannon, straight down the fairway. I mean, you know, three, three, three hundred fifty yards, stuff like that. Right. And dude, my swing looks so jacked up. And here's the thing, I'm out there and I'm ripping them. You know, once I get consistent with what I'm doing, even though my my swing looks like shit, I'm still hitting them pretty good. But I haven't even got on a course yet. I'm gonna get some irons and go through the paces, and I need lessons. I need I need any kind of help at all. But dude, it feels good when you hit a good one. But when you watch, or at least when I watch myself back. You know, I'm looking at these guys around me, and there's people out there that are outstanding, and then there's people that are out out there that are actually worse than me. Sure. I mean, I'll, I'll miss the arbor, you know, I'll miss the obligatory ball here and there. <laughs> I'll just swing for the fence and just miss it. And that when you whiff one, you just kind of sit there with your thumb up your ass, and you're thinking, you know, the guy behind you saw you. <laughs> <laughs> and I hit a couple of worm burners, and then I hit a couple of just dribble out there. You do if, if every now and then, if I if, if I hit one and it doesn't go past ten feet, I will go out there and retrieve that ball and hit it again. <laughs> Dude, I have done that too. I have. Dude, done. I ain't too proud. Piss on a mulligan. I'm gonna go out there and take that some bitch back. <laughs> Have you ever videoed yourself? Because, God, you talk about a hair-raising, eye-opening experience, dude, seeing yourself on video. Because all of a sudden, I'll start swinging pretty good, and I'm knocking the hell out of them straight. But when you watch that footage back, there's so much room for improvement in my swing. It is friggin' unbelievable. Dude, I have never videoed uh, myself, nor have I have I been videoed on my golf swing. But I will tell you this, man. I took lessons from a guy, and it was the best money that I had, I had ever spent because, you know, when I was in college and afterwards, you know, playing softball with all of those yahoos, we, you know, we all golf, but it was just, you know, like, like caddy shack and caddy caddy's day, you know? And once I got serious about it, I took some lessons from a guy and, and boy, I mean, it was, it was life changing for my golf game. And then I had a custom set of clubs made because, you know, I was doing off the rack, clubs and you know being six five that's that's not the way to go um yeah no dude i mean sometimes you'll you know you'll hit one that's just beautiful and other times you could have hit it further with a tennis racket you know it's like dude are you kidding me you know i'm i'm six five 250 teeing off and i top the ball and it goes straight in the air and with with you know, 400 miles an hour of top spin, it rolls about four feet away from me. And I was like, dude, are you serious? Are you serious? You know? Yeah. Yeah. So you're, you're, you're in for, you're in for a lot of fun. <laughs> dude, but you know, when you get a hold of a good one, it just goes hauling ass out there and straight down the pike. And it's just like nothing, you know, there's nothing like it. It just feels good. Oh, absolutely. So yesterday morning I went and a large bucket of balls over here in LA is 115 balls. It cost you 12 bucks. And so I went and I hit 115 of them. 
And my problem is, you know me, Teddy, I'm ADD. Right. You know, hell, I'm, I'm out there. I got 115 balls. Hell, I'll, I'll whack five of them in a minute. You know, that's, so it's, it's like I got to slow myself. I might hit six of them in a minute. I got to slow myself down because I'll just put another ball in that little gimmick tee and just start ripping. And by the time, you know, all of a sudden you get halfway through, you're blowed up. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I hit the morning balls, and then I told Chris, and then I went, then I went and did my workout. So I was, I was tired, and I'd already hit. And of course, I go out there last night. It's about seven thirty p.m. when I get there. It lasts till they stay up until ten or eleven. Got the lights going. I go out there, you know, get warmed up. I get in, I get into a stretch of about fifteen or twenty just rockets, and then from there, dude, I hit the wall. I was missing the ball. I was driving it. 10, 15 feet, 20 yards. And I know the dude behind me had this sweet swing and he was just working with his irons and his game and stuff like that. So, you know, I'm, I know this guy's thinking, man, what a, <laughs> what is this guy doing out here? You know, because he wasn't there when I was hitting the good ones. He's watching me hit this dog shit. Right. And then I said, dude, you hit the wall. And here, here, here's how bad it was, Teddy. You know how cheap I am. I probably had about 18 balls left in that bucket. Yeah, I put them in that little gimmick rack in front of that, that little tee box. I gathered them up. I said, dude, I said, I'm fried. You want the rest of these balls? He goes, sure, man. So I handed my balls, and I knew that it was time for me to take my ass and get, just get off there because I was going so far downhill and getting so down on myself. It just wasn't, it wasn't worth a shit. Dude, some, some days it's like that. You know what you need to do? You said you only got one club. What do you got, a driver? I got a Callaway Rogue driver. That some bitch cost me a, a, a pretty penny, but that's the club that I hit best with on the damn video. Right. And right. That, that's all I got is a driver. Dude, you need to go get like a seven or an eight iron and there and the reason being it's a it's a, a little bit obviously it's a shorter club because it's an iron uh it's it's got more loft to it so it's easier to get the ball up in the air you know what i mean and when the ball goes up in the air you don't notice you know that that you you hooked it or you sliced it like when you hit your driver you know i mean you got to be dead nuts on with your driver to hit it straight and long you know you're either you know making a, a real you know real sharp snap hook you know or you know a, a power slice or you know yeah but get yourself a seven or an eight iron something a little more lofted and when it starts to go bad with your driver switch to an iron and just slow down and start you know popping some balls up in the air and you know if nothing else man it'll make you feel better in your mind because you're not you know looking at everybody going come on Damn. I'm in all these worm burners. You have got to be kidding me. Oh, look at that little 13 year old kid just hit the ball about 225 yards. You know, yeah, it's like you little prick. You know, yeah. Man, in the place, you know, every time I go, like when me and Kristen went this morning, it was pretty packed. And like I said, dude, you know, on one on one hand, I don't give a shit. On the other, I'm highly competitive. Oh, sure. You know, and I'm hitting these worm burners and these these ten footers. And you know, like I went and got the one. And then, of course, Kristen's right behind me, and she saw me do the swing and a miss. And now it's one thing for Neil to coach me up because he plays for the high school team. And he's been playing for years. So now Kristen, my wife, starts coaching me up because she used to play, and you know. When your wife's sitting there telling you, hey, you your, your left knee's all wonky and you're wobbling it. <laughs> <laughs> My left knee hurts. That's why it's all wonky and I'm wobbling no. it. <laughs> God, dude, dude when, when Neil told me, he goes, Uncle Steve, he goes, keep your left leg still. You know, because, you know, the pros will actually get a little bit of that left leg action. It'll come in a little bit because I've been yeah. watching slow motion on YouTube. And he goes, he goes, Uncle Steve, he goes, they can do that because they're professionals and they've got all the, they've got all the basics down. He goes, you need to be very rigid. I'm paraphrasing because you need to be very rigid with that left knee. You can't move it. And then, you know, he goes, you see the way I come back with my club? And, you know, he just moves, you know, with the shoulders. You mm -hmm. know, I, I'm, I'm making it all about the whole torso. Dude, I'm, I'm trying to put everything in this son of a bitch. Right. He goes, keep it here. And, I, you know, I understand what he's talking about now. So when I when I listen to him and I just swing, I keep my, my left leg, you know, in the spot that it's supposed to be and don't basically move it and come back and keep my left arm straight, then I'm, I'm cranking. But, again, when I watch the footage back, it's a three-quarter swing, no follow-through. So what did you do when you went and got help? Because because there's a bunch of yahoos out there giving golf lessons. How do you know if you're getting somebody that's worth a shit? You know what? It's it's just a crapshoot. You know, you sign up for one, 
and, uh, you know, just, just get with the guy and, and hit some balls and see what he tells you to do. I mean, if it looks like, you know, he's an extra from 10 cup or something like that, then yeah, you know I mean? Save your receipt, you know, but this guy was kind of an older cat and he actually approached me because I was at the driving range, you know, and I was trying to put on a show, you know, that's, 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 oh, <laughs> that's, that's, that's my poor play, you know, come, come on, honey, you can watch me hit a bucket of balls, you know, and then, <laughs> yeah. And this guy come up and basically just, you know, got on me right there in front of this, this girl. And we started talking and, you know, just in, in five minutes time, you know, I was, I was begging for him, you know, to give me golf lessons. And it was just, you know, you go there for an hour, you know, once a week, and just he'd sit behind you, uh, you know, on a, on a folding chair. Nope. You go, you know, go like this. Just envision this. Slow down your swing. Do this with your hands. Do that. You know, and it's just like school, man. He'd give you homework, you know, go hit 500 balls and let's do it again next week. You need somebody that you don't know, you know, because I can tell you stuff. Neil could still tell you stuff. Kristen could tell you stuff, you know, but you need somebody. This guy was was a certified PGA instructor you know so he knew what time it was and how to correct you know the the stuff that i was doing because my swing being you know a ball player was was more flat you know and and he he picked right up on that and got me straightened out yeah well dude here's the thing i was talking to my uh one of my good friends in uh, san antonio my doctor jimmy and he, he's been out there golf and then he takes you know a golf lesson once or twice a week dude man i asked him i said what are you paying that guy and I think I get, I think he said about a buck fifty, buck sixty an hour. Man, I saw some people out there where I was at. I think they're like fifty five bucks an hour, dude. How much are you supposed to pay for this shit? Because that's a little steep. Dude, fifty fifty an hour. You know, to get you out of the gate, yeah, fifty an hour. Now, if you're you know spinning the ball and and you know drawing the ball, stuff like that, where you you've got the basics down and now you're fine tuning your game. Then you'll pay a little extra, you know, for that higher end stuff. But it's one of those, dude, I just, I just want to, you know, I want to have to go drive to get the ball, not be able to walk to get it, you know? So just get me there, you know? Yeah. Man, I started getting a fever the other day. And, uh, you know, of course, Tiger's been making a little bit of comeback. He's been doing pretty good in those last two tournaments. So I watched a little bit of Bay Hill that was on. And, man, when you watch those guys and then the club selection, what they're trying to do with the ball. And, you know, I've been watching. I watch golf, you know, every here and there. But it's not like I've been a golf fanatic. But, of course, when you get, when you get into golf, for some reason, you just go full in. And now you're hooked. Oh, sure. So now sure. I'm over, you know, tapping the veins in my arm. I'm ready to go hit a bucket. But, dude, when you watch those guys, just the selection of the club, how they're playing it, whether it's got a dog leg or anything like that, dude, those guys are so specific with the selection. And even talk with Neil about the pitch of his pitching wedge, 58 degrees, 60, the face of my driver, 9.5 or 10.5, all this rigid, regular shaft, stuff like that. You know, when I was out there, the few times that I did play, you know, an actual game of golf, you know, I, I kind of know what club I need as far as my irons go, you know, whether mm -hmm. it's a short shot, this out of whatever. But, man, those guys – and I, but at the end of the day, I'm a caveman swinging a club. Those dudes are high-level athletes that are doing the same thing over and over again with, you know – you know, repetition and the same consistency. And then that's why they're the best in the world. But you watch somebody like that, man, it, it is it really amazing to me now to watch those guys do what they do now that I'm getting turned on to the game. Oh, dude, those guys hit, you know, 500 to 1,000 balls every day. They've all got their, they still, they're professionals, yet they have a full-time coach, you know, that, that, you know, works with their swing, you know, to get to that level. Oh my God. You know, but I mean, they're, they're professionals. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, to, to put that much effort into your hobby, you and I can't do it. Even with a tee box at my house, dude, I hit about 40 balls and I'm like, dude, I'm over it. You know, I go and get my little golf ball picker up deal and walk around there and my flip flops and a beer and, you know, go pick up the balls. I'm like, all right, you know, let me go shoot a dozen arrows or so, you know, and that's about all I've got for that, you know, and let's go inside the house and do something. My game is getting better to the point where, you know, now I'll look at the card before I tee off and look at how the hole lays out, you know, figure out, you know, you can't hit driver on every hole. You right. know, there's, there's some times where the way the hole lays out, you know, I may, I may tee off with a six iron, 
I'm humble enough to know that if there's, you know, if it dog legs to the left, I'm not going to, you know, shower down on my driver and go over the top of all those trees like a drone and magically land on the green. No, you, you try something like that, that golf ball is MIA. You know, just hit it down the middle of the fairway like the 72-year-old guy that did it right in front of you and just keep playing on. <laughs> Dude, I got a friend. Uh, he used to be on the uh, Broken Skull Challenge with me. He's from uh, Vancouver, Canada, and he's like a scratch golfer. And he wants to turn pro by the time he's 50 and play on the seniors tour. Right. And that guy, I mean, he is really, really good. And, uh, you know, he saw a picture of my Instagram post uh, with my club and I had some range balls out there. I was fixing to, you know, slice and, you know, hook them and worm burner them. Every now and then hit a good one. So he, he sends me a text message. He goes, hey, man, next time in L.A., uh, man, let's go play golf. And he goes, if you want have Kristen take a picture of your grip because I want to see your grip. And then if she can get a video of your swing, send it to me and uh, I'll, I'll help you out. Dude, right. this, dude, the guy's an amazing golfer and a real smart guy. Play the shit out of guitar too. So anyway, I got the video of a couple of my swings. I'll send you one later. So I'm going to send my, my swings to him. But dude, when you sit down and watch the brutality of these big fucking swings... <laughs> It's embarrassing because, like I said, when I get a hold of one, I'm sending it. Now, if I had proper technique, I could probably get another 80 yards out of it. But the point is, it just looks like shit. So I'm going to send him the videos. And there, there's so many things going on at such a at such a catastrophic level. I don't know where he's going to start to begin to dissect my swing. I do. You know what? The other thing you got to keep in mind, man, is a lot of the real good golfers weren't, you know, ex wrestlers. You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, I love you to death, but you may not be, you know, the most fluid person, you know, to be to be around, you know, when you're when you're swinging and you know trying to you know drive your hips through and and rotating back, you know, hey, dude. We all got stuff that hurts, backs, hips, shoulders, knees, you know, hey, dude, that's, you know, if that's the farthest you can go back, you know, it is what it is. And like you were saying, you know, your, your one arm don't straighten out. Well, that's going to, that's going to, you know, create problems <laughs> where, you know, your the guy's going to say, well, dude, first thing you need to do is straighten out your right arm. Well, really, <laughs> you know, yeah, well, uh, that's, that's, that's on my list right after I cure cancer. <laughs> You know, it won't straighten out, dude. Well, yeah, I'm working. I'm working with a uh, with a few physical ailments, but I, I think I think I don't go all the way back just because if I go any further back, I think that's just a, that's another foot or a foot and a half I got to travel, and I've got the three quarter swing about halfway figured out with Caddy Wampus form. So that's something I'm gonna delve into. But anyway, Teddy, what else you got going on over in Rockport? <laughs> Man, it's it's coming back. And things are looking good around here. You know, now that the FEMA trucks are winding down, you know, the federal government was running around with those big old trash trucks with the uh, big crane in the middle of them. And everybody was taking, you know, all of the storm related debris and piling up on the side of the road. It was really depressing, dude, just driving around and you're just seeing you know, sheetrock and insulation and, and beds and chairs and appliances and lumber and, you know, all everything you could think of, clothes and stuff, just piled up on the side of the road. And the government was running those trucks 24-7, gathering all that stuff up. Well, they finally, you know, pulled the plug on that. So, you know, the streets are starting to get cleaner. Um, we are looking at opening about two or three more new restaurants here in Rockport. For us, that's a big deal. You know, Sushi Place is getting ready to open up. Um, you know, a lot of the out-of-town contractors have, have you know, <laughs> they, they made their money and burned their customers, and they're back to, you know, whatever rock they crawled out from under waiting for the next storm. You know, and, and it's, it, it's starting to calm down, and now it's a long rebuilding process. Oh, my damn. Dude, are you playing softball anymore? No, dude, I ain't got I don't have time for that, man. I haven't I haven't picked up a bat, you know, shoot in, in years, you know, and and now that the weather's turned, uh I'm I'm trying to take Sundays off. I mean, we've been going 7 days a week for, you know, almost 4 months. You know, and I mean, thank God my guys, you know, want to make money and you know, they're not afraid of working cuz we're you know, we're going 7 days a week. Um but no, not not doing anything like that. I took off a couple of Sundays ago and went fishing with Andy. 
but you know, no. I was gonna you know, ask you about that. You post that picture of redfish on Instagram. Y'all catch some yeah. good ones. You, yeah, yeah. You know, and it and it helps when your buddy is a guide. You know, because they're usually dialed in. And he had a trip the next day with some um, some young people, so we went out just scouting for fish. And you know, it's 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 very relaxing to get on the water, all catch and release. You know, so yeah, it's it's big fun. Yes, y'all just doing it for the fun of it. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean it's it's work for him because if you if you can find you know a hole full of redfish or trout, they're going to be there the next day. You know, so he can pull up there and throw some lines out and look like a million bucks in front of his customers because they get their string pulled right away. And you know the 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 people that are paying for the guided trips, you know, they want meat. They want you know a, a return for their investment. So, you know, so when you guys go, it's just catch and release to find the fish. But when the, the customers go, they're, they're keeping what they can to get their limit. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, because they don't, you know, I mean, I've got access to, i got a freezer full of speckled trout right now. I eat, you know, one one meal a week out of it. Uh, got some redfish fillets, so when I want to make ceviche, you know, but dude, as, as, as often as I go or, or have the ability to go, you know, if I catch a, if I kept a limit of fish all the time, you know, it'd all be freezer burnt and and really yeah, no sense in it. Yeah, yeah. So no, you know, I mean, if I, you know, I'm, man, I'm, well, what happened with all the technology that's going on? One one thing that pissed me off because I'm going back, man, and, and shit, way back in the day when we we spent all our time in Port O'Connor. Every now and then we go to Rockport, but Port O'Connor was where Dad went, so that's where we went. A man right there on on the front bay, on the front bay. Just hop in that water. You could wade out there, you know, and getting about probably water up to about almost three foot. We were using Coleman lanterns. We had a piece of foil on the back. We had a leader to keep the uh, the lantern tilted at an angle, shining down at the water. We're walking with a gig. We got a stringer tied on our belt loop, and we're gigging flounder. You see the stingrays settle in, or you'd see them skim by. You scooted your feet when you was walking in grass. And then, you know, all these years later, man, the guys got those damn boats with those high-powered light systems, and everybody started coming through there in the big-ass, you know, flounder boats. Sure. They're like, dude, to me, you know, and may- maybe that's a blast. I've never done it. But I just didn't have a desire to do it because, to me, going back to the days, there's nothing like the smell and sound of a Coleman landing when you got to pump that thing up a little bit and just kind of makes that noise that it makes and you got your two little filaments in there it's old school and you put some gas in there i don't know the game has all changed but that was one of my biggest kicks that i used to love to do was when we went down there at port o'connor we're just walking around there floundering uh you know what i mean it's a it, it's a society of convenience nobody wants to put that much effort into it i mean we built we built our own floundering lights out of a motorcycle headlight and some pvc pipe Take a motorcycle battery and a, a gallon thing of bleach, cut the top off of the of the bleach container, cut two slots in it so you could run it through your belt. You'd hang that motorcycle battery on that thing, a couple of alligator clips. You'd have a piece of PVC with a 45 on it and a big reducer, you know, a, a three by one PVC reducer. You'd take a motorcycle round headlamp put it in there, silicone it up so it's watertight, clip them alligator clips onto your, your motorcycle battery, and just start walking through the shallows, going at that with a little, you know, five-foot-long gig. Yeah, I, I go out every once in a while with the friends on the flounder boats, and it's cool because everybody can drink and laugh and cut up, but it's also cool just to get off on your own, you know, and, and do your thing. But nobody wants to put the work in like that. Dude, I have never heard about the setup that you just talked about. We were Coleman <laughs> Landers. No, 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 no. And, and we had that thing jerry-rigged with the foil in the back so it didn't, you know, it didn't shine out 360. It was 180 uh-huh. towards the water. The leader kept the tilt on it as you held the handle. What I'm not understanding, when you're talking about the PVC, the motorcycle light, I get the fact that you got the belt, the, the battery hanging from your, your belt and you got the alligator clips but what are you holding on to uh, as far as that lantern dude imagine your imagine your driver imagine your driver with the head angled down like that right it goes down to the head and then it, it 45s yep. out okay imagine that's a big round pvc reducer and inside of that is a motorcycle headlamp that you put silicone around the edge so it doesn't leak the wires go up through that hollow piece right. of pvc 
see, right? And you, you're basically holding it like you would be holding your driver. And you're just, you know, swinging it around in front of you. Got your gig in the other hand. And you got that light underwater? Yeah. Dude, that's the craziest thing I ever heard of. Todd Douglas introduced me to that. Little redneckery 101 right there. Dude, I have never, <laughs> ever seen or heard of a system like that. Did he invent it? Oh, you know what? I mean, it, I think it was it was passed down through the generations, you know. But no, he came up on that and he was like, man, let's go flounder. And I'm like, all right. You know, so yeah, he, he built a couple of those things and I was looking at it. I was like, you have got to be kidding me. And they work like a charm. Yeah. Do you ever see any stingrays out there? Oh, yeah. Those are the oh, coolest yeah. damn things. A lot of people, you know, boy, them, them stingrays will kick your ass if you step on them. But if you just, if you scoot your feet when you get, that's what my dad said. But when you get in a grass patch, scoot your feet. And it's funny because, man, you watch those stingrays come in. And when they kind of come in for a land and they're just gliding right over the surface of that sand. And they'll just, they'll they'll settle in. They'll they'll flap, you know, you know stingray shape. Yeah. They just flap their edges. And, dude... By the time they settle in, you can just barely see their outline. And then a flounder kind of does the same thing, but not as well as a stingray, in my opinion. Right. So that was the thing he always used to stress. He goes, scoot your feet. And so none of us kids ever stepped on a stingray, but they're just a real interesting animal to see because you, you don't always see them. No, you know, and now that the water's warm enough, we do a lot of, you know, a, a lot of wade fishing. And I, in the beginning, I would wear shorts, and now I'm, you know, wearing dry fit pants, you know, just wading pants that... Once you get out of the water, they're going to dry off real quick. Dude, the jellyfish, you talk about an eye opener, you know, because when, when you're wade fishing, dude, you're, you're thinking about fish. You're, you're throwing, you know, your lure, your bait out there. You're not really paying attention. And you walk into there and get wrapped up in a, in a jellyfish, which is, you know, and they're, they're pretty small. They're about the size of an orange. You know, but those tentacles hit you on, you know, the inside of your thigh or if you're, you know, in real shallow water, wrap around your ankle. And, boy, you talk about putting fire to you. Boy, I tell you what, yeah, you ain't kidding. I got lit up by a couple of those. You know, we grew up water skiing in the Intercoastal Canal, if you've ever been through there in Port of Conner. Oh, yeah. uh, yeah. Man, that's where we grew up skiing. And, and it, every now and then, you know, when you're floundering, you, you, well, you see a lot of them floundering, but you never get in them. But, yeah, man, go, going back to what you're saying, man, them things ain't no joke. Because they no, will light they... your ass up. <laughs> yes, sir. What else is going on, Teddy? Man, getting ready to go turkey hunting next weekend. Looking where forward to going? that. Where you Pearsall. Dude, I got hooked up with a guy that has uh, 300 acres, low fence, big bow hunter. I did some work for him, and we started talking, and, and he was like, you know, dude, man, you you, you know, you seem like a like, you know, pretty good cat. And I'm like, well, I got you fooled. You know? <laughs> <laughs> You know, but I mean, we started talking about, you know, ranching and deer and, you know, just, uh, you know, his, his theory on deer and my theory on deer and, you know, just kind of half ass became, you know, buddies about deer hunting. And he was like, man, like I said, I got 300 acres, low fence. You're welcome to come out anytime you want. And I was like, you got any turkey? And he's like, dude, we're covered up with turkey. I'm come like, on. I will be there next week. Really? You know, so, yeah. And like I said, he's a big bow hunter. Uh, you know, that, that fits right into, you know, what I want to do because I really want to, you know, go out there and fletch some turkey. So, you know, fingers crossed, we'll head out there, you know, next Friday and see what the place is all about. How bad can it be? Man, to tell that damn story about the time you was hunting on the other side of the high fence down at the Broken Skull Ranch and you was turkey hunting and you had that come to Jesus moment with a reptile. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, down there spring turkey hunting, and you know me down there by myself, I'm driving around with my headphones on, listening to my music, and going to go out for the, the evening hunt, so I stopped, you know, kind of close to the feeder, and I set my decoys out, and I was going to drive into the brush and, you know, park my buggy and then go get in my blind, and when I parked the buggy and turned it off, I, I climbed out, and I was bent over the seat, grab my pack and I could hear something through my headphones and it sounded like I was picking up static, you know, but I was, I was listening on my iPhone and I was like, man, there's no way I could be getting static through these headphones. So I hit the pause button and that's when I heard, you know, about a five, five and a half foot rattlesnake coiled up under the cactus. And I was, man, I was four feet away from it. And it was curled up and standing, standing up like they do and just buzzing like a son of a gun. And I was like, good God, you talk about, <laughs> yeah, 
it's scary, scary. And I, you know, I blasted that thing out. But first I took, <laughs> took a bunch of pictures of it, you know, because, yeah, you can't miss photo opportunity, you know. But it was it was the craziest thing because, you know, I mean, I was I didn't think anything about, you know, the dangers of, you know, and I, you've seen millions of snakes down there, you know. You know, and yeah, it was like, where is this static coming from? It's like, oh, oh, oh hello. <laughs> yeah. yeah. God dang, I was walking the turnbuckle one time and it was a shit. No, it was, it was afternoon hunt. And man, I parked there in that little alley we parked at. Uh-huh. I'm walking in, had my 308, and God dang, just bigger than Dallas. Started, Ch-ch-ch-ch. That's a rattlesnake. Yeah. I mean, dude, I mean, he, when, when those things start rattling, it's, it's so intense. And the thing about it was, he started rattling, and dude, I was literally 15 feet from him. And so I'm like, man, this guy's really edgy. So he gave, yep. me, he gave me a heads up, and I'm deaf as a doornail, but I don't wear my headphones out there so I can listen. You know, I was trying to make a little sneak onto the stand because I don't want to be loud. But I, I, I walked up on that snake, and I said, man, you got a lot of nerve. I, I own this place, and I know you're a part of wildlife, but I'm 15 feet out, and you give me a hell of a heads up. And I, I didn't even do nothing to piss you off. I wasn't even in your comfort zone. I said, dude, I didn't have my ears, you know, no earplugs to put in my ears. And I'm thinking, man, I'm just going to have to take this one for the team because I ain't letting this son of a bitch go. Right. Man, crosshairs right on his head. Boom! A 308. Missed him bigger than Dallas because he was 10 feet away, or at that point, probably six or eight feet away. But you know how it is when you look through a scope and you're dialed uh-huh. at 100. So on the second shot, I was successful. But then, you know, after that, everything I heard sounded like it was coming through a 10 cup. Because <laughs> <laughs> Because <laughs> I'm blasting my goddamn eardrums out, but I'll be damned. I mean, and because the other thing about it was, we loved our that stand. We all walked on the same path right there. So if if it wasn't me taking him out of the game, he might have messed up somebody's day. Oh yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. You know what I mean? It's a very unique sound. I mean, you you know, you're not going to hear that and go, "Well, that's an odd spot for you know a mariachi band." What are they doing out here? You know, yeah, no, you know exactly what it is. You know, when you hear it, boy, it'll it'll stop you in your tracks. That's for sure. Dude, one of my favorite stories when me and Chris was over at Riverside. We were riding on a buggy, and sure enough, coming around that corner, right at the edge of that uh, feed plot, whatever it is, food plot. It wasn't really a food yeah. plot, but right there on the corner, right there towards where you head towards uh, Johnny Cash. We ran the corner and said, "God." God dang it, big ass snake, and he, he was just rattling. And all I had was that Springfield XD9, and which I just got back from the, the new owners of the damn ranch. I drove down there and they'd found it. I thought it had bounced out. I'd stuck it between the mattress. They was moving the mattress and found my gun and had the kindness and the uh, respect to call me. And I went over and picked my gun up. But anyway, so back to the rattlesnake. I said, God dang, I said, I want to shoot that damn thing, but I ain't got no ears. Kristen, you know, Kristen's smart as a whip. She's got two degrees. She's way smarter than me. She goes, I'll stand behind you and put my fingers in your ears. <laughs> I said, well, that's great. Who's going to put their fingers in your ears? And she goes, oh, you got a point. I said, so anyway, I told Kristen to put her fingers in her ears. And that's when I, I've told you the story many times. I hunch my shoulders up. Have you ever tried to hunch your shoulders up while you're just standing yeah. there to cover yeah. your eardrums? Yeah. It don't work. No. So I got the 45 turned sideways. I've got my left ear just a little bit blocked off. The right ear ain't doing shit. I pumped about, dude, this is straight up truth, eight or nine shots in the general direction <laughs> in the, in the candy <laughs> wampus position. And, and dude, you know, with a pistol, I'm pretty, I'm pretty handy. Yeah. But with that type of form and technique, that son of a bitch hauled ass and we never saw him. He, somebody's <laughs> probably still running, but goddamn, I was going to give him hell. That's the old Grand Theft Auto shooting form, you know, <laughs> tilt, the, tilt the gun to the side and try to, try to shoot it like that. Yeah, it doesn't always work. Dude, it was a joke. Hey, man, one of the things, uh, I went out to uh, Nevada and I uh, went out there to the shooting range. And it's real handy because just a couple miles from the house. And I went out there and I've been trying to order some steel targets. And you're like, you and me, you had the shooting range down at the Broken Skull. We, just, you know, had our table, had our paper targets, had the whole setup. I go out there and I was like, man, this is cool. I'm going to pop a couple of caps off and, you know, go about my merry way. Dude, it, it ain't no fun when you ain't got no targets. And it's, right. it's, it's such a complicated process. Not really, but it is to order steel targets. And, I, you know, shooting paper kind of sucks. So I was shooting at a friggin' rock. It was about, I don't know, about as big around as, as if you put your two hands together, like a... 
you know, I don't know, it was about a six inch by six inch rock on top of a levee because of the distance markers that they got out there. So here comes some other dude. He's coming out to the shooting range and he says, hey man, I'm going down range. I said, cool. So, you know, I took my shit out, laid my gun on the table. He put his paper targets out and there I am over there shooting at a rock on top of a levee while he's over shooting at a fucking target. So, nonetheless, I spooled it up and took my ass home. So I've got some targets on order right now so I can goddamn shoot with some proper shit to shoot at. You know what, man? We've got an indoor shooting range here in Rockport that, uh, you know, it's got about four or five bays. Uh, it's about 50 yard long, which is more than enough for a handgun. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, and those those guys that I that I fish with, you know, Andy's a retired cop and uh, Mills is a judge and stuff like that. And those guys all get together, you know, once a month and go down to the to the range and, you know, shoot pistols. So I'm going to, you know, start doing that. I haven't shot a gun, you know, God, since, you know, since ranch days. Dude, I was checking into it because I got a shop over there at the uh, at the new place. And I was figuring, hey, man, do an indoor shooting range. Sounds dumb because you got the 90% of Nevada is BLM, so you can damn near shoot anywhere. Right. But, you know, if I didn't want to leave my compound, go in there, they take a 40-foot shipping container, do all this HEPA filters or whatever you call it on it. Anyway, at the end of the day, I think it's way too expensive to delve into. But when I, I'm not going to do the indoor shooting range. But the other day when I was hitting that damn golf ball, I was like, you know what? You can get a system like this. What do you think it costs for them systems, Teddy? Couple grand? One of those, uh, d- the video deals? Yeah, you just hit, all you oh, do is put some yeah, foam on dude. the wall and then it projects the thing and, and you just dial it in. That doesn't seem like it'd be too expensive. Oh, dude, I think you could pick one of those things up cheap, man, because I would imagine uh, they sell a, a homemade setup like that or a, a, a home set up like that on Amazon or something, man. I think that would be totally cool. I could see see a lot of late night drinking and hitting golf balls and <laughs> <laughs> in the shop, yeah, I think well, that'd be basically that'd be tells fun. you where the where the ball went. It tells you your miles per hour and all that shit. And if I wanted to, I could record my swing on my iPhone or, or put a camera up or whatever and watch myself. Because sometimes, you know, I like going down to the driving range, but half the time at night, I'm bored to death. I want to go do something. Uh, it's not like I'm mechanically inclined. I'm going to go uh, rebuild a motor or anything in a shop. So if I'm hooked on golf and it just seemed like a good way to kill some time and get better at golf. Oh, dude, you know what? I mean, you go to the driving range and if you're doing something wrong and you can't, you know, you can't see yourself, how are you going to correct it? You know, then you start trialing and error and, and, you know, move this. It's like sighting in the gun, you know, adjust this, do that, do this. It's making it worse. It's making it worse. Now we created a different problem. You know, golf golf is a tough game, man. You're it'll it'll be fun for you, I'm sure. Dude, I was watching this guy on YouTube the other day. He has this fiberglass stick out there. He's measuring angles on all, on this guy. He's showing the body position. He's he's showing, you know, how his hips and shoulders are over the you know, he's doing the whole fucking breakdown, right? And then, you know, the, the dudes that are hosting and say, hey, man, you take a couple of swings. He goes, well, I'm not, not really good with the driver. I'm, I'm really good with the irons. But just for shits and giggles, he hits it with the, the driver a couple of shots. Dude, he had the most jacked up swing I'd ever. He almost comes down on the ball like a hatchet and then rears back almost like a baseball player and whacks the ball. It was like nothing I'd ever seen in my life. And he's a guy out there coaching these dudes up, <laughs> telling them all the angles with this fiberglass rod. And then I'm watching the way he hits the ball. I'm thinking, man, what the F is going on? Dude, that is a whole nother money making market that that you'll start to scratch the surface of because you know sooner or later you'll be somewhere and there'll be a golf magazine and you'll be like yeah you know what while i'm waiting i'll go ahead and leaf through this and man here's a here's a, a training aid that you know this this club you know it's a practice club it's a weighted club it's hinged here it'll take the slice out and all of a sudden it's you know a hundred dollars for this 120 dollars for that you know and the next thing you know you got you know your garage is you are ripe for a yard sale you know because you've bought all these little gizmos and gadgets that's supposed to alleviate your slice alleviate your hook it's going to get you 10 more yards on your drive now, all that stuff is crap. You know, you just practice and, you know, get some lessons and keep practicing. Dude, I bought my first set of clubs at a garage sale when I was living in Georgia. 
And then, hell, I think I sold them at a garage sale <laughs> when, I, when I decided that golf wasn't for me. But I, I got a good driver. I'm going to get fitted for some clubs because I was talking to Jimmy today, and he goes, man, you got to get fitted for some clubs if you're going to be serious about it. You ain't got to buy no high-dollar clubs. Correct. Well, it's kind of like the, the old story about, like, you know, the, the guy comes to the pool hall, and he's got the, the case, and he opens the case, and he puts the stick together, and then there's the old fat guy across the pool hall, and he goes and grabs the, cook, the crooked stick out of the rack and just smokes the guy like it's nobody's business. So I do know I hit better with the, with the club that I bought versus the loaners. So I'm going to get me some damn clubs eventually. I'm going to get me some mm-hmm. lessons and uh, I'll bring myself up to speed and we can do the uh, the annual Austin Fowler Classic. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be I'd be good for that. Yeah. Well, hey man, it's good catching up with you. Uh, on Twitter and on Instagram, you're still at Ted Fallon three six one, correct? Yes, sir. Keep it locked down there, Teddy. I will do it. I will do it. Good talking with you. All right, man. Take it easy. Hey everyone, I'm Wade Keller, and it's WrestleMania season. So be sure to subscribe to the Wade Keller Pro Wrestling Podcast here at Podcast One. I produce two new shows each week. Every Thursday on our flagship show, I'm joined by a co host from the wrestling journalism field to talk about the hot topics in WWE and elsewhere. Every Friday, I'm joined by a guest who has worked in the wrestling business, including ex WWE creative team members like Kevin Eck talking about Drew McIntyre. Drew was a young guy, and did it go to his head? And did he walk around like he was the chosen? In one he did and i was frank with him and i said drew just so you know this is how they view you and podcast one's own christian harloff talking about his days working for wwe and vince mcmahon specifically as far as the perception of him i mean he's the king he walks in and it's just you can feel it i mean if the force was real you would feel the force <laughs> it powering into the room when he enters and pro wrestlers including nwa world heavyweight champion nick aldis also known as magnus talking about the challenges facing ronda rousey as she transitions from mma to WWE. I'm sure if you ask Rhonda, she'd probably say that this moment is is the result of hundreds of people's work, meticulous preparation and planning and timing and everything. And now suddenly it's like, go. And that can be very overwhelming. Just search Wade Keller on Apple Podcasts or on the Podcast One app or anywhere else you listen to podcasts. All right, everybody, give me the go home. Q's time to wrap up his podcast, Ride Off in the Sunset. Before I do that, I want to say thanks to Ted Fowler for joining me on the podcast. Good shooting the breeze with you and catching up. And I'm fixing to get my ass in the gym. Today I'm training shoulders and legs. And I am going to bust ass in the gym and have a great workout and get a little bit of cardio in. Hey, man, if you're looking for some badass T-shirts, I got some. My Broken Skull Ranch T-shirts are at ProWrestlingTees.com forward slash Steve Austin. And I got a damn good beer for you, too. My IPA is the best IPA on the planet. Broken Skull IPA from El Segundo Brewing Company. You can find Broken Skull IPA at Whole Foods and Total Wines if you live in California. And if you ain't in Cali, check out InsideTheCellar.com and see if they ship to your state. If you're looking for a badass pocket knife, which I highly recommend everybody should have, look no further than my badass cold steel Broken Skull knife or my badass cold steel working man's knife. You can get them both at my new Amazon store. Amazon has the best price on both knives. Just go to Amazon.com forward slash shop forward slash Steve Austin. And I want to say thank you very much one more time to all the fine sponsors of the Steve Austin Show. That's how I'm able to do this podcast for you twice a week for free. And you can find all my sponsors at PodcastOne.com. Just click on the Killer Deals button at the top of the page and then click on the Steve Austin Show banner. Hey, folks, I am on social media, Twitter and Instagram at Steve Austin, BSR. Folks, until next time, my name is Steve Austin. We'll have James Ellsworth on the Tuesday show, and I'll catch your ass down the road. This has been a Podcast One production. Download new episodes of the Steve Austin Show every Tuesday at podcastone.com. That's podcastone.com. A Baton Rouge police officer fired for the Alton Sterling shooting. I'm Jackie Quinn with an AP News Minute. The police chief in Baton Rouge announces the firing of one officer and the suspension of another involved in the fight and deadly shooting two years ago of Alton Sterling. Sterling's family's lawyer says it's time for the federal government to work to stop these police shootings. They give local police departments tanks, tear gas, pepper spray. 
any equipment that they need from the federal government, why can't they get involved in this epidemic? Police say that they still don't have a motive for the shooting death of a police officer in Hopkinsville, Kentucky. The suspect was shot and killed by officers early this morning. More than 15 Palestinian demonstrators reported killed in clashes with Israeli troops. U.N. Representative Riyad Mansour. It is a huge massacre against our people, which we condemn in the strongest terms. The U.N. Security Council called an emergency meeting. This is AP Radio News. I'm Jackie.